I'm ever so thankful to have you as always. Welcome back. We left off in our last Bible study, 1 Kings 13, yesterday, mainly focusing in on Israel, the northern kingdom. Once again, Jeroboam and Rehoboam are going to be the topics of this chapter, but this is the final chapter in 1 Kings that are going to be focused on. Both of these die in this chapter, and we'll quickly get ahead with all of these kings of the northern and southern kingdoms now it is worthy of note really quick that in the last chapter we spoke about the rebuke the very first prophet the man of god comes into israel quick rehash comes into israel from judah comes into israel at bethel and he rebukes he rebukes jeroboam at the altar once that he rebukes him, gives him clear sign, terrifies Jeroboam with his arm and everything, clear signs from God. Jeroboam, he goes right back into sinning. Well, just as we left off in our last study, I made mention of how if one sign doesn't work, God will increase it, and it will be very unavoidable the next time. Well, we see something far harsher happen to Jeroboam now. At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. So right off the bat, we're told Jeroboam's son is now sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself, that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is Ahijah the prophet, which told me that I should be king over this people. So Jeroboam, he's sending his wife in a disguise, which I think is pretty ridiculous, sending her to a prophet, which we'll get into right here in just a second. But she is coming from Terza, as we'll learn in a few verses. She's coming from Terza, the, which would be the second capital after Shechem was made capital. So it goes Shechem, Terza, and eventually Samaria, the geographical center of the northern kingdom. But right now we're talking about Terza. So the king is in Terza. She has to come down here to Shiloh. Now this is a desperation move, to say the least. On Jeroboam's part, <clears throat> one could ask, why didn't he consult his gods, his little idols? Well, obviously he did. This, the reason why I'm saying that it's a desperation move is because Ahijah was, it's believed that he hadn't spoken to Ahijah in a long time. And there were apparently no other godly men within the land. And this is quite common of, of people in general, but especially with royalty. Whenever the last imperial couple of Russia, uh, Nicholas II, whenever their son became sick, they sought help from this self-proclaimed healer, a uh, mystic named Rasputin, and it wound up not being a very good thing for them. It was actually, it's, he's one of the reasons why they fell, but... Um, People do this all the time. They consult preachers, prophets. They've done it throughout all mankind. Preachers, prophets, deacons, Sunday school teachers, even psychics, fortune tellers, horoscope, readings, whatever. And back then they had false idols, and they still do to this day. But they'll seek out anything. Whenever doctors' words are not coming through very positive, people become very desperate. In his book... A Grief Observed, which I recommend everyone to read by C.S. Lewis. It is probably outside of scripture the most heart-wrenching read that you can ever experience. But in the book, he's discussing the grief that he is feeling, and he's writing this book, very, very thin book. I, like I said, I recommend it to everyone. It's during the time of his wife's, right after his wife's death, and he's explaining his grief over this tragedy that's happened to him. And he writes in it, You never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death. Meaning, you say that you're a Christian. It's easy to do that. It's easy to say that you believe in Christ, that you love Christ, 
Jesus says, No greater love hath any man than this, than for a man to die for his friends. Well, he also says in another verse, He that loveth mother, father, sister, brother, <clears throat> anyone more than they love the Lord, they're not worthy of the kingdom. They're not worthy of him. He must be your number one love. Now, why am I saying all this? Well, because you must love Jesus and be more willing to die for him than you would your own children, than you would your wife or your husband or your parents or whoever. You must be war more willing to die for Christ than anyone else. Now I have to ask you, if a terrorist, let's say, were standing behind you, and you were in this long line of infidels, as they call us. And they say, if you deny your Christianity, if you deny Christ, we'll let you live. If you don't, we're going to take this little six-inch blade and we're going to behead you. What would you say? You never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death to you. And it's the very same situation right here with Jeroboam. He thought that he believed in these calves and these idols, but now he's seeing desperation. His son is about to die. And he says, well, go seek out this preacher, this prophet, go seek him out and take with thee ten loaves and cracknels and a cruise of honey and go to him he shall tell thee what shall become of the child and jeroboam's wife did so and arose and went to shiloh and came to the house of ahijah but ahijah could not see for his eyes were set by reason of his age and the lord said unto ahijah behold the wife of jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son for he is sick Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, For it shall be, when she cometh in, that she shall feign herself to be another woman. I like what F.B. Myers said about this. <clears throat> Jeroboam having his wife to disguise herself to a prophet. He says, How foolish. Jeroboam thought that the old prophet could penetrate the veil that hid the future, but not the disguise in which his wife wished to conceal herself. And I do not believe it's a coincidence at all, like I always say. I don't believe it's a coincidence that, that uh, these series of events leading the wife of Jeroboam down to this blind old prophet, there's no coincidence in this. Ahijah, the prophet, he couldn't make the trip to deliver this prophecy unto, which he's about to deliver unto the wife of Jeroboam, his better half. He's about to give this prophecy without ever leaving his home. Isn't that something? That's a display of how God's message will be delivered. It does not matter if you and I choose not to ever preach the gospel. If no one preaches the gospel, I am convinced that the rocks and trees will preach. I am convinced that the birds would preach it. I'm convinced that the dogs would preach it. I'm convinced that God can use anything at any time. I always say he's like a trillion D chess player. Everyone says 3D chess player. God, he's figured out all of this. He knows how to do it. But he finds a way to send this woman down to the prophet. He doesn't even have to leave his seat to deliver this message. And it was so when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thou thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. She thought he was coming. She was coming down to him. He says, I am sent to thee with tidings. This is God delivering the prophet to her. <laughs> Notice also how he tells her, For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. That means I have bad news for you. Those are the last words that you really want to hear. They, if from anyone, really. <laughs> you, you never want to hear those things from a doctor. You don't want to hear, I have bad news. From a doctor, from your wife, your husband, your boss, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whatever. But these words, I am sent to thee with heavy tidings, 
This is coming directly from God. This is from heaven. This is inescapable. You cannot be relieved of what horrors that that is to hear that. I have bad news for you. Anything that's said after that is not good, and you know that there's going to be more said. What terror, and how much more terror is it to hear, Depart from me, for I never knew ye, ye that work at the iniquity. Forever and ever, depart. Jesus says he'll say those words to many more than he won't say those words to. That is terrifying. Go tell Jeroboam, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, For as much as I exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, and who followed me with all his heart, to do that only which was right in mine eyes, but hast done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger, and hast cast me behind thy back. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam, and will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam, as a man taketh away dung, till it all be gone. Him that pisseth against the wall is a man, in case you don't know. Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat, for the Lord hath spoken it. Now it's quite probable that Jeroboam's wife may have collapsed or fell to her knees as depicted right here because the prophet says arise thou therefore get thee to thine own house and when thy feet enter into the city the child shall die this has such a feeling of what happened in Egypt and to the Pharaoh and how his son died his son and notice how there's a couple of or a sign or two before it preceding this travesty how this is preceding it but the child shall die this shall be a sign unto the people of what the prophet Ahijah is about to tell her concerning the nation and all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave because in him there is found some good thing toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. God took away the only good thing of Jeroboam and that was his son and whom apparently loved the Lord. He may have been not a child as depicted in these types of pictures. He may have been a teenager of sorts, not sure. Moreover, the Lord shall raise him up a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam that day. But what, even now? For the Lord shall smite Israel, as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of this good land, which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river, because they have made their groves, provoking the Lord to anger. Now we do know that this prophecy will come to pass. It will be about 300 years later after the time that we're speaking on. But the entire, all of Israel, from the reign of King Saul all the way down until the Babylonian captivity of Judah, all the way down there, it's about 464 years. 464 years until they come back and rebuild it, Ezra and Nehemiah, until it's rebuilt. Well, that got me to thinking about that is it's 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 always right in between nations always last about 200 to 400 years and then they fall here's an article from foreignpolicy.com and it's about empires with expiration dates the article goes on to say such calculations though crude allow us to compare the lifespans of different empires the three roman empires were uncharacteristically long-lived by comparison the average Near Eastern Empire, listen to this, 
the average Near Eastern Empire, including the Assyrian, Abbasid, and Ottoman, lasted a little more than 400 years. The average Egyptian and East European Empire is around 350 years. The average Chinese Empire, subdividing by the principal dynasties, ruled for more than three centuries, 300 years. The various Indian, Persian, and West European empires generally survived for between 200 and 300 years. Well, the reason why I'm reading this about how long nations last is because let's just say that this prophecy was told to me. And and if it was spoken to me, that would get me to thinking about how is my nation going to end America? Well, I did a little bit of math. And... If you go back to the colonial period of North America, then you would see that in 1607, the first colony was founded at Jamestown, Virginia in 1607 by England. Many of the people who settled in the New World came to escape religious persecution. Now pay attention to this. The Pilgrims, founders of Plymouth, Massachusetts, arrived in 1620. We're exactly 400 years from the time that the Pilgrims came over for religious freedom in America. You can say, well, no, the United States was founded in 1776. Yeah, but let's go back to the time that the pilgrims came on over. The first religious Christian people came over here. And that would be uh, 1620, exactly 400 years. So I got to think, and let's just say that America only does have a few more years left. That's devastating. And it happens quite often. We read about how rich Solomon was and how wealthy and how he had become a superpower. He made Israel into a superpower. Five years after Solomon's death, it only took five years for all of that wealth to leave his kingdom and for it just to be one city-state of Jerusalem. We'll see that right here in just a second. Only took five years. It can easily happen to America. It can easily happen to any nation if God desires it. But the prophet goes on. And he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who did sin and who made Israel to sin. So this woman is about to leave. And she knows before she even shall, shall reach the threshold of the door. But she has just been told you will never see your child alive again by the prophet. I bet she was devastated. But this child's death, once again, was a sign of Israel's death. And Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Terza. And when she came to the threshold of the door, the child died. And they buried him, and all Israel mourned for him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by the hand of his servant Ahijah the prophet, and the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred, and how he reigned. Behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. I feel like I'd be doing you all a disservice if I didn't show what kind of wars that he went through and how he died. This evil first king of the ten northern tribes, Jeroboam. Well, as we'll see right here, Jeroboam, he reigns for a total of 22 years. Rehoboam, now they both came into power at the same year. Rehoboam of the southern kingdom, he only reigned for 17 years. So that would leave another five years after Rehoboam's death that Jeroboam would still reign. Well, Rehoboam, his son Abijah, takes over for Rehoboam. He succeeds the throne. He becomes king. So now you've got King Abijah. Jeroboam is still in power. So now it's Abijah versus Jeroboam. Second Chronicles 13 tells us this about them going to war. And they do. And Abijah and his people slew them whenever they went to war with a great slaughter. All of Jeroboam's men. So there fell down slain of Israel 500,000 chosen men. Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed, because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. 
And Abijah pursued after Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel with the towns thereof, and Jeshana with the towns thereof, and Ephraim with the towns thereof. He's conquering all kinds of what Jeroboam had. Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him, and he died. Okay, now you must know that Abijah, he only reigned for three years. So that would leave Jeroboam reigning for an, an additional two years after Abijah dies. And Jeroboam, he still has two more years, but he's stricken with something. John Gill said this about Jeroboam's final days. And he died, Jeroboam, not immediately, for he lived two years after Abijah, but continued under a lingering disease he was smitten with and which issued in his death. So the last couple of years for Jeroboam were not spent him being all joyful and royal. He he spent his last, you know, couple of years sick. So Jeroboam suffered his last two years as king. And that brought, brought to mind, I wonder if he thought about it. I wonder if he thought this is for all my idolatry. Surely he thought about it. And maybe it was even a merciful thing of the Lord, or maybe the Lord gave him over to a reprobate mind or something. But I'm certain that Jeroboam was not so stupid that he didn't wonder this is the Lord's punishment. And the days which Jeroboam reigned were twenty, were two and twenty years, twenty-two years. And he slept with his fathers, and Nadab his son reigned in his stead. So right there we have the summary of the final days of Jeroboam, the king of the northern kingdom. Now we're going to go back a few years and the Bible is going to tell us about Rehoboam, the king of the southern tribe of Judah. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 40 and one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also sodomites in the land. Now pay attention to this. So they're falling head over heels into this pagan worship and sodomy even. They're, I mean, just everything. And there were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Notice how the KJV says sodomites were in the land at that time. This is why I always recommend people, if you want in-depth study, go to the KJV. We see on all these other translations over here the very same verse. Once again, the KJV says, And there were sodomites in the land. Well, what does the New King James say? And there were also perverted persons in the land. What? Perverted persons? New American Standard Bible, there were also male cult prostitutes in the land. Male cult prostitutes? That is actually closer to the definition in the Strong's male cult prostitutes, but a male cult prostitute, that could mean that you're given over to women as well. Sodomite says that it's just homosexuality. The Berean Study Bible, there were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. Go down here to the Christian Standard. Cult prostitutes, male cult prostitutes, prostitutes at the shrines, men and women. Here's the Good News translation. Worst of all, there were men and women who served as prostitutes. It's just clearly about gay men. That's what it's talking about. It's gay men. But here it's mixing men and women. And I, you see the distinction right here. The rest of the translations are scared to come against homosexuality. They're terrified to. But... And some of them kind of allude to it, as the New American Standard and the Berean and all these. But the KJV outright says there were sodomites in the land. It's fearless. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam. Now pay attention. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord. And the treasures of the king's house, he even took away all, and he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields, and committed them unto the hands of the chief of the guard, which kept the door of the king's house. 
Five years into Rehoboam's 17-year reign, only five years it took for all of Solomon's wealth to disappear. And not only that, but once that this Shishak was coming up, we're told in uh, 2nd Chronicles 12, <clears throat> once that this Pharaoh is coming up to go to war against the southern tribe, he's also conquering the city-states along the way, or at least the settlements along the way up to that. He's pretty much only left, Rehoboam is pretty much only left with Jerusalem, and maybe one or two more. <laughs> he's not left with anything. And it was so when the king went into the house of the Lord that the guard bare them and brought them back into the guard chamber. Now we're told, last note on Rehoboam's final days, Second Chronicles 12 tells us how after this happens, Shemaiah in uh, 1 Kings 12, Shemaiah makes his first appearance. He's the one that interceded whenever Rehoboam was wanting to go to war against Jeroboam in the north. But we also read in 2 Chronicles 12 how the very same prophet Shemaiah, he comes up after the desolation of the southern kingdom. He comes up to Rehoboam and the people and he says it's because you disobeyed God and then we read about how they repent at that time Judah is pretty good about repenting they do evil but they do repent for the most part but that's really the only good note that we hear about Rehoboam and there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days and Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. And Abijam, the his son, reigned in his stead, as we've already talked about. Now, notice real quick how it mentions his mother's name. Pretty much every time that it gives this intro or outro for Rehoboam, it'll mention that he's the mother of an Ammonitus. And that's believed to be a subtle hint at the reason for this fall because this is a foreign strange woman that Solomon had married early on in his life and God specifically told him do not marry such but he did now we see the ruins of the kingdom basically almost but that is it for tonight's study I hope that you all learned something God of peace be with you all amen very good morning to all of you everyone I'm so thankful once again to have you all joining us welcome back we left off in 1 Kings 14 with the deaths of Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the first two kings of the divided kingdom of Israel and Judah. We pick up now in 1 Kings 15, 1. Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Now Abijam he was first called Abijah, the son of Rehoboam, the first king of the southern kingdom. But it's in the 18th year that Abijah comes to power. Why is Rehoboam's son's name changed from Abijah to Abijam? Well, you must know that Abijam was an evil man. And I actually believe that it was his idea to change his name given the meanings behind the names. Abijah, whom he was originally called, means my father is Yehovah, which is the name of the true God. But Abijam is my father is the sea, which is an idolatrous God. It's a false God. He probably worshiped a God of the sea. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom couple of things to take note right here real easy real quick notice how he only reigns three years in Jerusalem and also his mother's name was Maacah the daughter of Abishalom remember that for just a few verses ahead when we're talking about Asa but as you'll see over here his father Rehoboam reigned for 17 years but uh, Abijah he only reigned for three years proof that God did not bless this man's reign his son Asa that comes after him which we'll talk about here in just a minute <clears throat> but his son Asa he reigns for 41 years Jeroboam it's also worth noting Jeroboam the first king he reigns for 22 years and he sees four 
kings sit on the throne of David. Jeroboam was the one in whom first seen Solomon, and then he sees Rehoboam, Abijah, and Asa. He lives to see all four of these kings. Now let's continue with talking about Abijah. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. That's, oh, that's such a painful thing to read. It's, you know, David, perfect before the Lord. Even though we were, we've already went over David's reign and how many mistakes that he made, but there's one very notable, one mistake that just sticks with his legacy now all the wives that he had the concubines and how he disobeyed the lord so many times and he lied and he feared and all of these different times none of those things are mentioned except save only the matter of uriah the hittite and there was war between rehoboam and jeroboam all the days of his life now the rest of the acts of abijam and all that he did are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the, of the kings of judah and there was war between abijam and jeroboam and Abijam slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa his son reigned in his stead. And in the twentieth year of Jeroboam king of Israel reigned Asa over Judah. So as we've already discussed, how Jeroboam finally gets to see this good king come up to reign over the southern kingdom while he's reigning over the northern kingdom, he is very afflicted, Jeroboam is, by some disease. And forty and one years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. Now we just read about Asa's father, Abijam, and his mother was named Maacah. Well, it's just like how they say in David his father, this is the way the Jews talk. They don't say great-grandfather or grandfather, they just say father, meaning that they're ancestry. Charles Ellicott clarified this. He says, Maacah was the wife of Rehoboam and therefore grandmother of Asa, the king that we're talking about right now. He's the grandmother of Asa and the wife of Rehoboam. She appears, however, still to have retained the place of queen mother to the exclusion of the real mother of the king, which does make one ponder what happened to Asa's mother. Why is his grandmother queen at this time? Well, Joseph Benson, he gives good comment on that. His grandmother's name may be here mentioned rather than his mother's because his mother was either an obscure person or was dead or unwilling to take care of the education of her son. And so he was educated by the grandmother who, listen to this, though she poisoned his father Abijam with her idolatrous principles, yet could not affect Asa. So this queen mother, Maacah, is the grandmother of Asa, the king. And she's an idolatrous woman. So idolatrous, in fact, that they talk about a grove where she had built up a phallic-like statue. And we know that there was sodomy in the land at that time. So there was worship of the phallic symbol, the male uh, genitalia, if you will, much like the Egyptian obelisk. This is what Asa's grandmother, Maica, would have been worshiping in the grove. It's strongly believed. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And he took away the sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. And also Maica, his grandmother, even her he removed from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove. And as Asa destroyed her idol and burnt it by the brook Kidron. Here is an actual image of the brook Kidron. This was basically a place where they threw all the trash, got rid of all of it. It was a dumping area. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. 
Now, you may think that it's talking about him leaving up certain idolatrous places. That is not what Asa did. He destroyed those idolatrous places, but he left up these other high places where people had once worshipped the Lord. Second Chronicles 14.3 tells us this, For he took away Asa, for Asa took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places, and break down the images and cut down the groves. He got rid of all the idolatrous places. But apparently it was not pleasing to the Lord that he left up the ancient worship altars where they had worshipped him before. He wanted all those destroyed and Solomon's temple to be the only place where they could worship God. And he brought in the things which his father had dedicated and the things which himself had dedicated into the house of the Lord, silver and gold and vessels. And there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. Now notice how the scripture mentions Baasha. Still talking about Asa, okay? But notice how it's not mentioning Nadab, whom is the successor to Jeroboam. It's not mentioning Nadab, Jeroboam's son, but it's going right to Baasha going to war with Asa. That's because Asa and Baasha, they had more dealings. Nadab had only reigned for two years. Then Baasha assassinates him. But it's mentioning Baasha right here. We're about to get into a little bit of info on Nadab, though. And Baasha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might not suffer any to go out or come into Asa, king of Judah. Right here is Ramah. This would have been the pathway that they took into Judah and crossing the border. And this is where Baasha is taking control. And we are told in the book of Jeremiah how much that Asa, the king of Judah, how much that he feared Baasha. He actually built a pit. And Jeremiah makes a specific mention that he feared Baasha. Then Asa took all the silver and the gold that were left in the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and delivered them into the hand of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tebramon, the son of Hezion, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying... Now we start to see <clears throat> Asa, he's starting to crumble, he's starting to fall apart. He has a really, really good reign, but at the end of Asa's life, he, he really starts to uh, go off the deep end a little bit. But he, for the most part, he reigns a very good reign, benefits most people. But right here we see him taking out the treasures in the house of the Lord. Now the Lord doesn't get angry with him over this. This is just a showing. Him taking the treasures out of the house of the Lord. Out of the temple. This is just a showing of what the Lord really sees in his heart. And that is what God makes mention of. But apparently Baasha, the king of Israel at this time that we're talking about. Baasha, he had an alliance with the king Ben-Hadad of Damascus of Syria up here so they were in alliance and Asa the king of Judah he sends these treasures to Ben-Hadad trying to separate the two he no longer wants them to, to be allied there is a league between me and thee Asa writes to Ben-Hadad there is a league between me and thee, and between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent unto thee a present of silver and gold. Come and break thy league with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. So ben hearkened unto King Asa, and sent the captains of the host which he had against the cities of Israel, and smote Ijon, and Dan, and abel beth Mechah, and all Sinaroth, and all the land of Naphtali. So the king Ben-Hadad of Syria, he begins to attack right up here. And he starts conquering all of these lands, going down through north of the northern kingdom. And it came to pass when Baasha heard thereof that he left off building of Ramah and dwelt in Terza. Once again, Terza is the capital of the northern kingdom right now. It will soon be Samaria. Then King Asa made a proclamation throughout all Judah None was exempted, and they took away the stones of Ramah, and the timber thereof, wherewith Baasha had builded, and King Asa built with them Gebal of 
Benjamin, and Mizpah. So everything that Baakal, the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, everything that he built up in Ramal, Asa has destroyed and uses that to build up these other settlements. The rest of all the acts of Asa and all his might and all that he did and the cities which he built, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? Nevertheless, in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. So we just seen how Asa, he took the treasures out of the house of the Lord gave them unto the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, in order to help him. Well, right after that, we're told about Hanani, this seer, this prophet. He comes into Asa, and he rebukes him in the name of the Lord. Now listen to this, very close. And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Now listen to Asa's response very unexpected response to this prophet then asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house for he was in a rage with him because of this thing and asa oppressed some of the people at the same time he's even oppressing his people oh, keeping some of them you can see he's he's going off the rails right here now this would have been in his old age so the lord is more angry with asa over his heart how he was re more reliant upon Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, than he was on upon the Lord's protection of him, as he was in his youth. Well, there's also one other matter that happens to Asa. And Asa, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet, until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not the Lord, but to the physicians. So this is another case where it's a lack of faith showing in this good king Asa. So what do the scholars think about this disease? What was wrong with his feet? Donald Wiseman says this, It is more likely, in view of Asa's age, the severity of the disease and death within two years to have been a peripheral obstructive vascular disease with ensuing gangrene. This is the disease talking that we're talking about right now you can see the great progression going on it rapidly this gangrene will start to just spread throughout and eventually if you don't have your feet amputated or whatever limb you, that you don't have it amputated you'll eventually uh, succumb to it and Asa slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David his father and Jehoshaphat his son reigned in his stead Okay, so right there we see the end of Asa's life, his son Jehoshaphat taken over. Now the Bible is going to go way back in reverse, about 40 years before the time that we're at right now. It's going to go all the way back 40 years, and we're going to come to the son of Jeroboam, Nadab. Now we're going to hear about him. And Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned over Israel two years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the way of his father, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. And Baasha, remember Baasha, the one that we were talking about, this is talking about the death of Jeroboam's son Nadab. And Baasha, the son of Ahijah, of the house of Issachar conspired against him, and Baashal smote him at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. For Nadab and all Israel laid siege to Gibbethon. So Nadab had led the Israelite army to attack the Philistine city of Gibbethon. While they were besieging it, Baashal assassinates Nadab and takes over the army and the nation of the northern kingdom. Even in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, did Baashal slay him and reigned in his stead. 
Okay, now the next verse, something very important is going to happen. All right, so we are talking about these three kings right here. We've went over Jeroboam, Nadab, whom we just got done talking about, and Baashal. We've talked about these three, all right? Jeroboam, as you'll remember in just a few studies ago, Jeroboam was given the same promise as David that if he obeyed the Lord and his commandments and his statutes that he would give all these descendants would be from the lineage of Jeroboam. Jeroboam would have reign through his descendants all the way all these many, many years. Well, we know that he doesn't 